To discuss what the president's done and where he's headed, we're joined now by Kellyanne Conway, counselor to the president. Kellyanne, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Thank you, Chris. So uh, we just heard President Trump say it's all working out very nicely, but in fact, as we've seen, there are protests across the country, and now federal judges have stepped in uh, to at least tempor temporarily block deportation of people who would come in who are banned from coming in under his order. Shouldn't that have been worked out before this order went into effect? The judge in Brooklyn, the Obama appointee judge in Brooklyn's uh, stay of order really doesn't affect the executive order at all because the executive order is meant to be prospective. It's preventing, not detaining. And so you're talking about 325,000 people from overseas came into this country just yesterday through our airports. It's 325,000. You're talking about 300 and some who have been detained or are prevented from gaining access to an aircraft in their home countries and must stay for now. That's 1%. And I think in terms of the upside being greater protection of our borders, of our people, it's a small price to pay. I am told by the officials that anyone has been detained, if there's no further threat, if they're not dangerous to this country, they can expect to be released in due course, as most of them have already. And, but, so the ones that are here will be allowed, if they're vetted, to stay. You're talking about the people who came on aircraft? Yes. Um, yes, if they're vetted, it's a routine screening process that they'll go through. If they are not dangerous, if they're not a threat, then they, they will be disposed of in a case by case. Their situations will be handled on a case by case basis. Uh, you know, I was, I was stopped many times, weren't you, after 9 11? I didn't resemble or share a name with or be part of any kind of terrorist conspiracy, but this is what we do to keep a nation safe. I mean, there are this whole idea that they're being separated and ripped from their families, it's temporary. And it's just circumstantial in terms of whether you were one of those 300 and some who was already on an aircraft or trying to get on an aircraft, um, as opposed to the over 3,000 children who will be forever more separated from the parents who perished on 9-11. President Trump says, if we let refugees in, the Christians will be given priority. Here he is. If you were a Muslim, you could come in. But if you were a Christian, it was almost impossible. I thought it was very, very unfair. So we are going to help them. First, that's not true. I want you to take a look at this. As you can see here in 2016, almost as many Christian refugees were admitted as Muslims. And second, President Trump is barring people from seven countries, the ones you can see on the map, but not included on the list are Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Afghanistan and Pakistan. And Saudi Arabia is where most of the 9-11 hijackers came from. Why are they not on the list? This list of seven countries was offered by President Obama and his administration. In 2015, Well, that's never Chris, stopped you before. Well, but hold on. In 2015, Chris, Congress passed the Terrorist Prevention Act. And what it essentially did was it identified the seven countries, an expanded list from four, and identifying them as a threat. These are countries that have a history of training, harboring, exporting terrorists. And one thing that's very important to recognize that whether you're the Orlando shooter, yes, he was born here, but went abroad, you know, was radicalized on the internet. If you are San Bernardino, if you are the Sarnoff brothers in Boston, these are people who traveled abroad, were radicalized, were trained, and then came back and did their bloodletting, their massacre here on American soil. It's no different really than what happened all across Europe. And so we can't just keep on looking the other way and pretending that there aren't people out there. There isn't a terrorist organization, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, otherwise, no, but who wants to- Kellyanne, the specific question I'm asking you is, Saudi Arabia, for instance, that's where the 9-11 hijackers, most of them came from. Why not block them? The Congress and President Obama's administration but came up with this list of seven. Order. Right, came up with a list of seven. We're following on that in week one. Uh, this president will certainly keep identifying uh, threats and risks. And look, Chris, people can't have it both ways with President Trump. They can't say on the one hand, well, he's not taking these briefings seriously. When he is, he has a presidential daily briefing. He is privy to information that the rest of us aren't, particularly the media. The political media aren't national security intelligence experts receiving briefings every single day like our president is. A president will always have information. Congress will always have information. The rest of us do not. And let me make very clear, these seven countries, what about the 46 majority Muslim countries that are not 
not included. Right there, it totally undercuts this, this nonsense that this is a Muslim ban. This is a ban on travel, prospective travel from countries trying to prevent terrorists in this country from countries that have a, a recent history of training and exporting and harboring terrorists. The president also got into a rift this week with Mexico after he signed an order calling for construction of a wall and insisted that Mexico was going to pay for it. We got this response from Mexican President Peña Nieto. Here he is. Mexico does not believe in walls. I have said time and time again, Mexico will not pay for any wall. And then Peña Nieto, I don't have to tell you, canceled his visit this week. That was mutual. The president suggested it first on Twitter at about 9.24 a.m. that day on Thursday. Well, so it was it, mutual it's cancellation. Not a, it's not a good thing, is it, that, that one of our closest allies, our uh, immediate neighbor to the south, and they had a meeting scheduled for Tuesday? You, don't th you think that's a good thing? It's a great thing that they spoke for an hour well, after, after how about that. having an, uh, the state visit? I'll tell you right what's now. not a great thing. Here's not a great thing. It's not great that we have a $60 billion trade deficit with Mexico. It's not great that they allow, because there is no border, there is no, there is no respect of our sovereignty in this country, Chris. They allow people and drugs well, to just flow over that border. Uh, well, you know what? Kelly, we'll that, is a, that is an overstatement to what say that, overstatement? that we have no border and that there is no respect for is our it an overstatement? Well, is it an overstatement to say that there are not illegal immigrants, people and drugs flying over the border? No, that's certainly true. You know who I want Fox News to go interview? Go interview all those parents who have left, who have lost children to opiate use and all those family members, not even children. It's a scourge in our society. And the idea that we just allow drugs to flow over our border and we look the other way, it stops with President Trump. He ran on this. It's been a centerpiece. He signed executive orders this week to do a couple of things, to start construction of that southern, of that wall. It's a physical wall. But he also, in that executive order, Chris, he has expanded the resources and tools that he will give our brave men and women in law enforcement and our border agents. They simply can't do their jobs. You have to expand the physical space for detaining but, but Kelly, and stop and this nonsense. You're, you're answering release. the question I'm not asking. The question is, the question is, about it, trying to work out a relationship with Mexico that doesn't so offend the Mexican president that he has to cancel a meeting and where relations with the U.S. become a matter of national honor. And I want to raise the issue of a possible trade war, which is now being raised between Mexico and the U.S. And I want to put up the practical implications of that. Mexico is our third largest trading partner. If we slap a border tax on their imports, and 20 percent is a number that's been mentioned by people in the White House, U.S. consumers will have to pay more for such things as cars and fresh food, and six million U.S. jobs that depend on trade with Mexico will be hurt if they tax our exports to them. In addition, Kellyanne, if Mexico goes into a recession, then we're going to have even more illegal immigration. Have, has that all been thought through? Well, we're not going to have illegal. They may try, but they're not going to get here the way they've just been pouring over the borders in the past because of President Trump. But what you're saying about the 20 percent tariff, that's one possible option, as we have said as an administration, that's one possible option in terms of funding the wall. But let me go back to the major point about our relationship with Mexico. It was candidate Trump no, 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 who wait, accepted wait, 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 the no, invitation. Please, I'm asking you a question about a possible trade war. Isn't that a dangerous thing if we're slapping taxes on their imports and they're slapping taxes on our imports? And doesn't that destabilize Mexico both politically and economically. I'm not saying that no, we shouldn't build a wall and we shouldn't protect our border. I'm just saying there's a good way of working it out and a bad way of working it out. There's a fundamental fairness that Donald Trump ran on, won on, and will execute as president of the United States. You saw it already this week, whether he's meeting with manufacturing CEOs, laborers, he's doing the Dakota and Keystone pipelines, and he's telling Mexico that this trade imbalance stops. You know, this idea that we're always worried about the other country, we're always worried about its citizens. This president says America first. 65 percent of them in a poll this, this week country. said... Consumers have to pay more. It's going to affect this country. Not, if we lose some of the six million jobs, it's going to affect this country. If they have a recession and more illegal immigrants, come in, it's going to affect this country. None of us want that. We want a strong, vibrant, prosperous Mexico. There's no question. That's why the two presidents spoke by phone this week. But remember, this whole nonsense that Donald Trump as president does not want a good relationship with Mexico, he's the one of the two candidates who accepted the invitation of this Mexican president to go to Mexico during the campaign. And now the visit's been canceled. And he did that. No, they talked by phone. There are many different ways for leaders to get work done. I mean, look, look at how many foreign leaders President Trump talked to just this weekend. It's, it's a Disney. Seeing 
it's a dizzying number. Uh, Russia and France and, okay. and and Australia and certainly we had Prime Minister May here, but they will con continue to talk. But Chris, the other statistic people have to realize is the number one source of revenue going into Mexico are Mexicans in the U.S. sending money back to Mexico. I mean, people feel like things are just unfair here. This man, as president, will do what he promised all along. He will put America first. That includes its workers, its safety, its people, its interests, and its I, allies. I want to move to a couple of other issues while we have the time. President Trump says that he will announce his Supreme Court nominee this week. Yes. Can you guarantee that his nominee will favor overturning Roe v. Wade? I can guarantee you that the promise that president, that candidate Trump made will continue as president, that he's a pro-life president and he uh, assumes that he will, well, he has promised that he will appoint pro-life judge, judges, including to the Supreme Court. Here's the thing about uh, the Supreme Court battle we're about to face. If passed as prologue, the way that Democrats in the Senate have treated our cabinet nominees does not bode well for filling that vacancy left by Antonin Scalia. Uh, it, it's just been terrible the way they tried to humiliate and embarrass our cabinet nominees. We still don't have a Secretary of Commerce, a Secretary of Treasury. What are we and, doing over there? Me, I am going to go bring that up with Dick Durbin in the next segment, yeah. so I, I promise you. But I want to press on this. You spoke at the March for Life rally on Friday, and you said this. This is a time of incredible promise for the pro-life movement, but I don't have to tell you, they don't want promise, they want Roe versus Wade overturned. Will the president nominate someone committed to doing that? Yes or that no? That will come up in the person's hearings. I mean, they, they, of course, they'll be obsessively asked that question, not so much about the Commerce Clause or about extraterritoriality, but they'll be asked about Roe versus Wade obsessively. Uh, let me tell you about well, the action. He, he, no, but can you tell Mexico us that City it, policy uh, to those week? hundreds of thousands of people who were out there on the mall who you said, this president hears you, is he going to appoint somebody who wants to overturn Roe v. Wade? He's going to appoint somebody who respects the Constitution. And I haven't heard the word penumbra since 1973, have you? Uh, in other words, we've got this... No, it's a good word, but well, no, I haven't heard it since It's a word that you haven't heard because nobody dare use that word. That to... was the explanation for how Roe v. Wade got... Uh, Not just got the a... explanation, it's a Supreme Court decision on how we allowed... But look what's happened since. We've had millions of innocent, uh, innocent babies uh, taken from their mothers. We, we are having this culture of life now that does not respect life from conception to natural death. And this president gave the most, this Manhattan male billionaire who was pro-choice most of his adult life gave the most impassioned defense of life that any of us had ever heard coming from a presidential podium. Okay. Said to Hillary Clinton, you and your ilk are really extreme on this issue. You're for partial birth, you're for sex selection abortions, which basically extinguishes the next generation of girls, not boys. You're for taxpayer okay. funding abortions. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but well, I got it. That's what's I, on the table here. We're running, we're running out of time, and I want to ask you about one other issue, and that is the president's relationship with the press. Here is what he had to say about that this week. The media, much of the media, not all of it, is very, very dishonest. Honestly, it's fake news. It's fake. They make things up. And chief strategist Steve Bannon went much further. Quote, the media should be embarrassed and humiliated and keep its mouth shut and just listen for a while. But Bannon wasn't finished. The media has zero integrity, zero intelligence, and no hard work. You're the opposition party, not the Democratic Party. You're the opposition party. Kellyanne, do you understand how offensive that is? I understand how offensive it was to never be taken seriously that Donald Trump could be elected president. On great days, we were ignored. On most of, days, a lot we of, were mocked. A lot, of us, a lot of us reported on it fairly. And, 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 and that's a different issue. No, no, no. It is the issue because it extends into this presidency, Chris. You can't put a piece of tissue paper between the way Donald Trump was covered as the Republican candidate, the Republican nominee, the president-elect, and the president. It's all the same. It is an anti-Trump screed. It is completely disrespectful to the office of the president. Why? Look at what happened this week. Nobody's interested in learning the policies. It's just I've been asking you about bite. policies today. I asked look, you about the vetting. I asked you about Mexico. Yes. I not, asked you not about the Supreme Court. Equally. All of those are legitimate questions. Yes, not every, not every, look, not every network and every print outlet is created equally in this, but if you read people's Twitter feeds, that crap would never pass editorial muster in a newspaper or on your TV show and your network here, nor should it. And so the idea that tweets are my own, really at 10.45 a.m. while you're walking out of the the, the, the place where you work. I, I, all I would Tweets say is, are not your own. much to the dismay of some of the people here at Fox, I don't tweet. Look, look, it's but, but, let me get to, but let me get, about... No, let me get to, if I may, to the real point. Politicians complain about bad press. I think you have some legitimate complaints about bad press. The First Amendment protects the press. It, we're in the Constitution, and 
it is offensive, quite frankly, to have folks, any politician, but folks who have been in the White House for a week lecture us about what we should and shouldn't do and that we should keep our mouths shut. Well, no, that I think what's, no, what, what my colleague Steve Bannon is saying is why don't you talk less and go listen to America more? Because let me tell you something. I know what he meant. I work with him every day. The media failed to learn America. Donald Trump proved something that the media failed to do, which is he understood America. The, the idea that, that we, we were never fine. taken that seriously in places like Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. We have zero intelligence, zero integrity, and that we should keep our mouths shut is offensive. I think it's called listen more. And let me just say something that else happens. Uh, it's the way that everything is cherry picked. It, biased media coverage is easy to detect. It, it frankly helped us because this was such an elite rejection election where the establishment, the elites were all rejected by the voters. It turns out there are a heck of a lot more of them than us, Chris, and that's how we won. Why is that relevant? It's relevant because people, where, who's cleaning house? Which one is going to be the first network to get rid of these people who said things that just weren't true? Talk about fake news. Talk about alternative facts. What happened last week? I went on three network Sunday shows. I spoke for 35 minutes on three network Sunday shows. You know what got picked? The fact that I said alternative facts, not the fact that I ripped a new one to some of those hosts for never covering the facts that matter to America's women, the 16.1 million women in poverty as we sit here, the 12.4 million women who have no health insurance. Everybody should feel outraged. The billions of dollars we have spent as a nation on public education only to have millions of kids trapped in schools that fail them and never really promote and protect their intelligence and prepare them for the world as they, as they all deserve. They shouldn't be restricted by the zip code where they live. They should be lifted up. This has all been a colossal failure, and nobody wants to talk about that. They want to talk about, it's always zing, it's always playing gotcha. There's no question that when you look at the contributions made by the media, money contributions, they went to Hillary Clinton. We have all the headlines. People should feel embarrassed. Not one network person has been let go. Not one silly political analyst and pundit who talked smack all day long about Donald Trump has been let go. They're on panels every Sunday. They're on cable news every day. Who's the first editorial writer? Where's the first blogger that will be let go that embarrassed his or her outlets? We know all their names. I'm too polite to call them out by name, but they know who they are, and they're all wondering where I'd be the first to go. It's The election was three months ago. None of them have been let go. If this were a real business, if the mainstream media were a, were a thriving private sector business that actually turned a profit, which, which is not true of many of our newspapers, Chris, 20% of the people would be gone. They embarrassed. They failed, to, they failed to protect their shareholders and their board members and their colleagues. And yet we deal with them every single day. We turn the other cheek. If you're part of Team Trump, you walk around with these gaping, seeping wounds every single day. And, and that's fine. I believe in a full and fair press. I'm here every Sunday morning. I haven't slept in in months. I believe in a full and fair press. But with a free press comes responsibility. And the responsibility is to get the story right. Bias coverage, easy to detect. Incomplete coverage, impossible to detect. That's my major grievance, is that the media are not they're not giving us complete coverage. President Trump has signed all these executive orders this week. He's met with these heads of state. He's done so many things to stimulate the economy, to boost wages, to create jobs. Where's the coverage? Kellyanne, we're going to have to leave Thanks it there. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it's been fun. And let me say, you didn't rip me a new one. Not at all. Thank, Thank you. you. I talk like a Jersey girl sometimes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nancy, on the one hand, well, he's not taking these briefings seriously. When he is, he has a presidential daily briefing. He is privy to information that the rest of us aren't, particularly the media. The political media aren't national security intelligence experts receiving briefings every single day like our president is. A president will always have information. Congress will always have information. The rest of us do not. And let me make very clear, these seven countries, what about the 46 majority Muslim countries that are not included? Right there, it totally undercuts this, this nonsense that this is a Muslim ban. This is a ban on travel, prospective travel from countries trying to prevent terrorists in this country from countries that have a, a recent history of training and exporting and harboring terrorists. The president also got into a rift this week with Mexico after he signed an order calling for construction of a wall and insisted that Mexico was going to pay for it. We got this response from Mexican President Peña Nieto. Here he is. Mexico does not believe in walls. I have said time and time again, Mexico will not pay for any wall. And then Peña Nieto, I don't have to tell you, canceled his visit this week. That was mutual. The president suggested it first on Twitter at about 9.24 a.m. that day. 
on Thursday. Well, so it was a mutual it's cancellation. Not a, it's not a good thing, is it, that, that one of our closest allies, our uh, immediate neighbor to the south, and they had a meeting scheduled for Tuesday, if they're vetted to stay. You're talking about the people who came on aircraft? Yes. Um, yes, if they're vetted, it's a routine screening process that they'll go through. If they are not dangerous, if they're not a threat, then they they will be disposed of in a case by case. Their situations will be handled on a case by case basis. Uh, you know, I was I was stopped many times, weren't you? After 9/11, I didn't resemble or share a name with or be part of any kind of terrorist conspiracy, but this is what we do to keep a nation safe. I mean, there are, this whole idea that they're being separated and ripped from their families, it's temporary. And it's just circumstantial in terms of whether you were one of those 300 and some who was already on an aircraft or trying to get on an aircraft, um, as opposed to the over 3,000 children who will be forevermore separated from the parents who perished on 9-11. President Trump says if we let refugees in, the Christians will be given priority. Here he is. If you were a Muslim, you could come in. But if you were a Christian, it was almost impossible. I thought it was very, very unfair. So we are going to help them. First, that's not true. I want you to take a look at this. As you can see here in 2016, almost as many Christian refugees were admitted as Muslims. And second, President Trump is barring people from seven countries, the ones you can see on the map, but not included on the list are Saudi Arabia and Egypt and Afghanistan and Pakistan. And Saudi Arabia is where most of the 9-11... To discuss what the president's done and where he's headed, we're joined now by Kellyanne Conway, counselor to the president. Kellyanne, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Thank you, Chris. So uh, we just heard President Trump say it's all working out very nicely. But in fact, as we've seen, there are protests across the country and now federal judges have stepped in uh, to at least tempor temporarily block deportation of people who would come in who are banned from coming in under his order. Shouldn't that have been worked out before this order went into effect? The judge in Brooklyn, the Obama appointee judge in Brooklyn, uh stay of order really doesn't affect the executive order at all because the executive order is meant to be prospective it's preventing not detaining and so you're talking about 325,000 people from overseas came into this country just yesterday through our airports it's 325,000 you're talking about 300 and some who have been detained or are prevented from gaining access to an aircraft in their home countries and must stay for now that's one percent and I think in terms of the upside being greater protection of our borders, of our people, it's a small price to pay. I am told by the officials that anyone has been detained, if there's no further threat, if they're not dangerous to this country, they can expect to be released in due course, as most of them have already. And, but, so the ones that are here will be allowed, you don't, th you think that's a good thing? It's a great thing that they spoke for an hour. Well, after after how about that, having an, uh, the state visit. I'll tell you what's not a great thing. Here's not a great thing. It's not great that we have a sixty billion dollar trade deficit with Mexico. It's not great that they allow because there is no border, there is no there is no respect of our sovereignty in this country, Chris. They allow people and drugs well, to just flow over that border. Uh, well, you know what? Kelly, we'll and that, is a, that is an overstatement to say that, overstatement? that we have no border and that there is no respect for is our sovereignty. Is it an overstatement? Well, is it an overstatement to say that there are not illegal immigrants, people and drugs flying over the border? No, that's certainly true. You know who I want Fox News to go interview? Go interview all those parents who have left, who have lost children to opiate use at all those family members, not even children. It's a scourge in our society. And the idea that we just allow drugs to flow over our border and we look the other way, it stops with President Trump. He ran on this. It's been a centerpiece. He signed executive orders this week to do a couple of things, to start construction of that southern, of that wall, it's a physical wall. But he also, in that executive order, Chris, he has expanded the resources and tools that he will give our brave men and women in law enforcement and our border agents. They simply can't do their jobs. You have to expand the physical space for detaining but, but and stop you're, this nonsense. You're, you're answering the question I'm not asking. The question is, the question is about it, trying to work out a relationship with Mexico that doesn't so offend the Mexican president that he has to cancel a meeting and where relations with the U.S. become a matter of national honor. And I want to raise up and hijackers came from. Why are they not on the list? This list of seven countries was offered by President Obama and his administration in 2015. Well, that's never Chris, stopped you before. Well, but hold on. In 2015, Chris, Congress passed the Terrorist Prevention Act. And what it essentially did was it identified the seven countries, an expanded list from four, and identifying them as a threat. These are countries that have a history 
of training, harboring, exporting terrorists. And one thing that's very important to recognize that whether you're the Orlando shooter, yes, he was born here, but went abroad, you know, was radicalized on the internet. If you are San Bernardino, if you are the Sarnoff brothers in Boston, these are people who traveled abroad, were radicalized, were trained, and then came back and did their bloodletting, their massacre here on American soil. It's no different really than what happened all across Europe. And so we can't just keep on looking the other way and pretending that there aren't people out there. There isn't a terrorist organization, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, otherwise, no, but who wants to... Kellyanne, the specific question I'm asking you is Saudi Arabia, for instance, that's where the 9-11 hijackers, most of them came from. Why not block them? The Congress and President Obama's administration but came up with this list of seven. Order. Right, came up with a list of seven. We're following on that in week one. Uh, this president will certainly keep identifying uh, threats and risks. And look, Chris, people can't have it both ways with President Trump. They can't.